All right, so we are going to begin chapter 11. We're going to kind of do, in our red Stuart textbook, we're going to do 11.1 and 11.2 combined. And um, we're going to skip uh, just a few parts of that because uh, we're going to talk about something called Riemann sums a little bit later. So if you're following along in the textbook, you'll notice that we're not doing some of the examples in there. But this lesson gives you a good introduction to what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we're going to talk about derivatives that we have spent the whole course talking about. And then we're going to talk about area under a curve that we just got finished doing in the first few section, couple sections of chapter 10. And then I'm going to connect the two together uh, in, in something called uh, an integral, okay, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So uh, in the introduction, this is in your textbook, and I thought it's really good. Uh, it's just an outline saying that uh, there's two main branches, as I discussed earlier in the class uh, of the course, two main branches of calculus, that is differential calculus and integral calculus. And so we spent the first 10 chapters really talking about differential calculus. And that is all of the calculus that arises from the tangent problem, right? The instantaneous rate of change and that sort of thing. So that's, we've talked about rules and um, applications of derivatives, right? We started just in chapter 9 talking about antiderivatives. So how do we take a function and instead of taking the derivative, how do we go the other way and find out well, what would have been the function if this that we're given is the derivative? What's the parent function? And that's sort of getting into what integrals are uh, through antiderivatives. Okay, so the main concept in integral calculus is the definite integral. Okay, and there's ways that this can be interpreted, um, but as, as we'll soon see, one of the ways that you can interpret the definite integral is area under a curve. Okay? And so really what we've been doing in chapter 10 is finding area under a curve. Well, we're going to now call that and the integral. Okay? So the integral is really going to be the area under the curve uh, for our purposes as we introduce this. So it's going to be kind of the same. And that's going to tie into what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the fundamental theorem of calculus links the two branches of calculus together. So how do derivatives and integrals fit together? And of course the link is antiderivatives there in the middle. All right. So uh, let's see, there's other applications of integrals which we'll, we maybe get into in the, if you take advanced placement calculus, we'll get into that uh, sort of stuff a little bit later. But first of all, I want to talk to you mainly about uh, this right here. Now this is the notation for an integral. Okay, and so we're gonna, it, it's talked about in the textbook as well. So just down here is a little bit of the explanation of what this looks like. So this symbol right here, okay, and which is an elongated S, okay, and Leibniz introduced this. It's the integral sign. So this elongated S. So if this is an S, right, this is an elongated S. It's not an F without a little hatch in the middle. It's it's an elongated S is what it is. And it's supposed to represent um, sum, okay? So capital uppercase sigma is summation. And um, when we talk about the area under a curve, remember I think I talked to you guys about this, is that if we have smaller and smaller rectangles stacked underneath a curve, we can add up those areas of all of those little rectangles or trapezoids, remember? We can add up all those to approximate the area under the curve. And, and so that's that idea. It's the sum of what would be, if you take a look at a curve here, if we took a look at the um, rectangles that would be fitting underneath the curve, the approximate area of all of these little rectangles would be the area under the curve. And so that's the sum of that. And, and so that's where that comes from. Okay. Um, okay, so the notation, okay, so um, in this part, this is called the integrand, okay? So the f of x, the function, whatever's underneath there, is called the integrand, okay? And a and b here, so let's do a different color. a would be the lower limit of integration. So if this is an integral, to take the integral would be integrating. So this would be the lower limit of integration, and this would be the upper limit. Together, those are the limits of integration. So it's kind of like saying, remember we said, let's find the area between A and B, right? And above the x-axis. So that's what we found. 
in chapter 10. We were able to do that using antiderivatives. And so guess what? A and B are going to form sort of the, the lower and upper uh, limits here when we talk about an integral as an area under a curve. It's, that's not the only definition for an integral, but that's what we're going to connect here. Okay, uh, a lower limit and upper limit. Okay, it should be noticed here, and, and again, because we don't quite have the background uh, yet, uh, as, as far as these Riemann sums is what they're called, the sums of all of these little rectangles, uh, I, you just have to trust me in this, in that uh, when we talk about the height of a rectangle here, it's roughly coordinating to the height of the function. So let me just blow this up a little bit. The height of the rectangle roughly coordinates to the height of the function at any point on that, that for that rectangle. You see that? So the rectangle is taller where the function is larger. And the width of those rectangles would be a small change in x. And so this d of x here, dx, represents the height of a rectangle and this represents the width of the rectangle. So to get the area of these little rectangles that we're envisioning, we take the height, which is the, the uh, function, and then the width, which is a small differential. So all this to say, guys, all this to say that when we look at the integral here, these always have to go together, the integral sign and the dx, okay? Those always fit together. And obviously the other, the other part, main part, is the, the function, okay? So um, there'll be more explanation on the dx and all that when we talk about Riemann sums, but that's sort of a little bit of background. Okay. So the procedure of calculating the integral is called integration. All right. So as I said, we're talking about areas under a curve, and we've done a, an example like this just recently. And note this. Um, this is how they introduce the area under the curve being equal to the integral. For the special case, now this is, we're going to do an example here where the function is completely above zero, okay? Then this integral between a and b, in this case we're going to take the integral between zero and three, the integral that we find will be exactly the area underneath this graph, okay? So how did we do this before? Well, what we did in chapter 10 was we took the antiderivative of the function, right? So what is the capital F of x for this function? Well, 3 of x becomes what? 3 over 2x squared. Very good. And x squared becomes 1 over 3x cubed. Is that, is that good? And of course, plus c, but we don't have to use the plus c because we're actually finding an area. We're not just expressing sort of what the expression of the area would be. So how do we find the area? Well, we do uh, the antiderivative of uh, f, so capital F of 3, right, minus what? Capital F of 0, okay? So we take, this is b, and this is a, and we take capital F of b minus capital F of a, and that gives us the area. Now this is, this re really is for uh, this is only for where the graph is above zero. That was the same in chapter 10. So how would we do this? Well, f of uh, 3, capital F of 3, would be uh, equal to 3 over 2 times uh, 3 squared minus 1 over 3 times 3 cubed, right? And f of 0 would be... 3 over 2 times 0 squared minus 1 third times 0 cubed. So if we took the uh, difference there, what would we get? Uh, 3 squared is 9, so 9 times 3 is 27 over 2 minus uh, 27 over 3, I guess. 3 cubed is 27. And then, of course, this would be 0 minus 0, so minus 0. So 27 over 2 minus 27 over 3 would be our area, okay? And, um, okay, so 4.5 or 9 over 2 units uh, squared. So that's the area underneath this curve, okay? So that's how we did that. Now, um, what happens, like, what happens if we have, what happens if this, this graph continued on? and we wanted to find an area between zero and let's say five. What's the special consideration there? 
Right. This area underneath the, the uh, x-axis, if, uh, if we did this, we'd have to, this would be a negative value, right? It's negative underneath here. So I guess what we'd have to do is we'd have to find this area, right? And then we'd have to find this area and recognize that we have to flip that sign and add them together, okay? Um, but did we come across a question like this? Like what happens if we were trying to find the area underneath this curve or between this curve and the x-axis between zero and five? Would we have to do anything different? All right, so like, for example, in, in 10.2, right, if we're talking about area between curves, whether it's above or below the axis doesn't really matter. The fact that we take the antiderivative evaluated at the right point and subtract it from the antiderivative evaluated at the left point, it all takes that into consideration, positive, negative. It, 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 it takes it all into consideration. So I guess the question here is we still do f of capital F of B minus capital F of A, no matter where the end point is, whether it's above or below, okay? So that's no problem. So here's an example. This is the kind of the drawing of this, okay? And um, what I wanted to let you know is that if we have um, the uh, area, if it's above or below the axis or any combination of those two, what we've been doing in chapter 10 will take that into consideration. And so this leads us to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which states the connection between um, derivatives and integrals, and that is antiderivatives right here. So what we've been doing already to find area between A and B is the definition of, uh, well, is the expression of the integral here. So the integral, that is the area between the curve and the x-axis, can be calculated by finding the antiderivative of f of x and, and finding the difference between the antiderivative evaluated at the far right limit minus the antiderivative evaluated at the far left limit. So this right here is super important, the fundamental theorem of calculus connecting the function and the um, derivative and the antiderivative, uh, so on, with the integral. So we're going to do this question right here, the one that just kind of... Uh, showed you and this is the way it's written right here so I'll just make that a little bit bigger so you can see it okay so if we were asked to evaluate the integral of 3x minus x squared from 0 to 5 that is let's find the area the combined area here of everything from the, the curve uh, to the x-axis this would be you know positive and negative and it's all going to kind of balance each other out so, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that I can just find the antiderivative evaluated at 5 and subtract the antiderivative of this function here evaluated at 0. So, what's the antiderivative of x here? Let's see, what is that here? Well, I think we just did that, right? I guess that would be 3 over 2 x squared minus one-third x cubed. So f of 5 minus f of 0 is 3 over 2 times 5 squared minus 1 over 3 times 5 cubed minus, uh, I guess that was the same as before, uh, so 3 over 2, 0 squared minus 1 over 3 times 0 cubed, which is going to end up to be, I guess, just 0. So this is interesting. Okay, so what are we going to get here? So 3 over 2 times, this is 25, so it's 75 over 2, uh, minus uh, 5 cubed is going to be, what, one, uh, 125 over 3? Ooh, okay, what are we going to get? So what is this? What's the simplified uh, answer here? What do we get there? Sorry? 50 over 3? Ah, thank you. Negative 50. Yeah. Negative 50 over 3? Okay. Is that what you guys got? I don't have, I mean, I don't have it in front of me here, but I think that's right. 
Okay, so yeah, just take it over six, re, 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 simplify it. So 50 over three units squared. Well, that's kind of interesting because it's negative, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's interesting, isn't it? So can we have a negative area? Huh. So you, what we have to understand is that the integral is not only area, it's really only the area when it's just above the axis here, that, that gives us the area. When we're talking about the curve going underneath the axis, the integral is kind of a combination of positive area up here, negative area down here, if you want to think of it that way. So when we're talking about movement or when we're talking about um, population, you know, uh, growth or decline or different kind of changes, we could have negative numbers for these things. So, so really, it's not only about an area. And this one, of course, would be, this is a negative. Because this area, the red area down here, is larger than this blue area. So you have a larger negative area, if you want to think of it that way. So the integral doesn't have to be just area uh, either. Okay, any questions so far? Yep. All right, so we just actually figured out that this is not negative. 50 over 3 is still is negative, but it's 25 over 6. Okay. All right. We good to go there? Negative. You can have a negative for an integral. Now, if we wanted to find the combined, the total combined area of area 1 and area 2, just as a positive area, we would have to separate this. Here's an area, and here's a negative area. Flip it at them. Okay? So you kind of, if it's below the axis, this, this represents a negative value. Okay? All right. So now that we got that all straightened out here. Fundamental theorem of calculus. Alright, so this is from your textbook here. It's a table of indefinite integrals. So basically, indefinite integrals are the same as antiderivatives. So what we've been doing in chapter 9. Okay, so you have to have your plus C there at the end of all these. Okay, Definite integrals, uh, you should probably write this down. Um, so just so we know, definite integral Okay, is a number, and sometimes it represents the area under a curve, right? So the definite integral is a number. It has uh, limits of integration. The indefinite integral is an expression, okay? So no limits, but you have to put plus C in the end, okay? So we've got to remember that about the integrals there. Definite integral is going to be a number. Some, a lot of times it's going to represent an area, okay, or a net change of some sort. An indefinite integral will be an expression. So no numbers, like a not, not a final number answer. Um, there's no limits of integration, and you have to remember to do plus C at the end, okay? All right, so let's take a look at an example from our text here. Okay. Okay. So he here are a bunch of examples here. Let's just take a look at one or two. So if we were asked to evaluate these, these are are these definite integrals or indefinite integrals here? Yeah, they're definite because they have the limits of integration right here. And we're talking, uh, they're asking us to evaluate. That means to find a number answer. So, this first one here, we're going from negative 6 to positive 7. The function is 2. And, and we're, we're, so that what we're going to do is we're going to find the capital F of 2, right? The antiderivative of 2. We're going to evaluate at 7. And we're going to subtract that from the antiderivative of 2 evaluated at negative 6. That makes sense? So what is the general antiderivative, I guess, for 2? Does it even have it on there? Just for a constant? Okay, what is it? 2x, right? Okay, so capital F of x here is 2x. So plus c, but we're not going to worry about the c because we're doing definite. So no c, no plus c when we're doing definite. So we have 2 times 7 minus 2 times negative 6. You see that? There's the function. And now I've got 7 in there. 
and it's 2 times 7. So f of 7 is 2 times 7. See that? Capital F of 6, sorry, negative 6 is 2 times negative 6. So what do we get? We got 14 plus 12 is 26. Okay, so there's your the value of that definite integral. Okay. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and try B, C, and D, and I'll show you the answers up here in just a second. And here are your answers for B, C, and D. Okay, so that's the lesson on, uh, yeah, the, uh, the introduction to integrals, the connection with the fundamental um, theorem of calculus, connecting... Uh, derivatives and antiderivatives and uh, derivatives and functions.